Now let's look in on the Northern Plains and the Lakota Alliance and see how the 1870s were working for them. Uh, when last we checked on them, uh, the uh, Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868 had ended Red Cloud's War and it had been uh, ended to, uh, in, a, in a good way for the, uh, the Lakota, particularly, as you will recall. Uh, there had been some conflict over, over territory between the uh, Lakota and the Crow. Well, this is how it, this is how it shook out. There was a new, uh, a new Crow reservation boundary was drawn. The Great Sioux Reservation there in Green was established. And notice there, there's a, a, a region to the, uh, to the west of the Great Sioux Reservation called Unceded Indian Territory. Now, that land is not part of the reservation, but it's still Indian territory. It's Indian land. Uh, it is where the, uh, the Lakota were allowed to continue operating and hunting. A lot of the Lakota bands did, in fact, move onto the Great Sioux Reservation, but many did not. Many chose instead to live out there in that unceded territory where they didn't have to answer to U.S. government officials in any way whatsoever. By the way, that Great Sioux Reservation was eventually broken into several smaller reservations. So there's a, a bunch of Sioux Reservations now, but that had originally been the, the concentration of them. Okay, now Remember that part about unceded Indian territory. That's, in, that, that's territory that they never gave up in a treaty, even though it's not part of the reservation. Remember that because that is going to be significant when we get to the 21st century, believe it or not. Well, that's how things were left. How are things going by the 1870s? The story of the Northern Plains in the 1870s is going to be very closely interconnected with the story of railroads, particularly the Northern Pacific Railway Company, Northern Pacific Railroad. Uh, in 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad had been completed with the Union Pacific there in blue and the Central Pacific there in red, meeting up in 1869, halfway there at the halfway point. And the goal of the Northern Pacific Railway, established in 1870, here, was to do the same thing farther north, obviously, to connect the Great Lakes with the Pacific Coast on a rail line that would go through the Northern Plains. This, uh, this route that you see in the picture is the, uh, the railroad as it would eventually be. It would take a while. It would, in fact, take the better part of a decade, although there was a, there was a pretty significant work stoppage due to, a, uh, due to a financial panic, but we'll get to that in a moment. So anyway, started in 1870 on the Pacific uh, Northwestern coast there and started building eastward. It was about three years, the summer of 1873, when they reached Lakota territory. Now, you have to stop for a moment and consider the far-reaching implications of a railroad like this. For one thing, uh, the government had been selling or providing rail railroad companies with land to, to build these tracks because it was uh, viewed as a good financial investment for the country, infrastructure. And that's exactly why it was bad for the tribes uh, who were in the way, because it was going to bring a lot more people. Not only due to the fact that, you know, people can get on a train and ride, but also due to the fact that people can now <clears throat> acquire land in far-flung places where they can 
uh, do farming or where they can establish mines and have railroads close by to take those products out. So that's going to attract more farmers, more miners, and more towns, uh, and so on and so forth. Also, you have to uh, uh, you have to take into account the fact that uh, this this wasn't really part of that whole we can build forts stuff that was in the original 1851 treaty. It could uh, very easily be argued <clears throat> by the uh, by the tribes that <clears throat> the government had absolutely no authority to be disposing of their land like this or providing their land to the railroads. But that's not going to stop the railroads. That's not going to stop progress in air quotes. That's not going to uh, stop the advancing of commercial interests. So, when they had reached as far as what is now Bismarck, North Dakota, and were preparing to go a little bit further, and let me take this opportunity to correct myself, I misspoke just a minute ago. They had actually started in the Great Lakes and were building westward. So they went through the Dakota Territory, what is now North Dakota first, before they got to what is now Montana. So as they were nearing what is now Montana, uh, and they were needing to scout out ahead uh, so that they could be planning on how to uh, go about laying the next part of track, anticipating that there might be problems with Indians, as there in fact had been with the Cheyenne when the Union Pacific was going through their territory farther to the south around 1867, the uh, U.S. government sent out uh, an uh, army contingent to, uh, to do the mapping and surveying. This contingent was about uh, 1,300 men. Uh, it was a, a, a mixed, mixed group of infantry, cavalry, and artillery. Overall command was held by Colonel David Stanley of the 22nd Infantry. Um, second in command behind him was Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer of the 7th Cavalry. Where have we heard of him? So uh, they, they entered into the area and immediately aroused the attention and the ire of the Lakotas in the region, particularly the, uh, the Hunkpapa Band, through whose uh, immediate territory they were, they were traveling, uh, and all their allies. And here are some of the leaders of those allies. First of all, Fizi or Gaul, who was a Hunkpapa uh, leader. He had uh, gained his name when he had uh, eaten the gall out of, a, out of an animal that, that he had killed. Uh, also, um, a uh, Hunkpapa leader named Itomagachu, or Rain in the Face. And he had gotten his name. A couple of conflicting stories. One story was that it was uh, spatters of blood on his face after a fight that looked like red rain. And then another story is that he had been fighting some enemies in a heavy rainfall and his war paint had been all streaked by the rain. Uh, either way, rain in the face. That was his name. Then we've got Tatanka Iotake, alias Sitting Bull, which in Lakota is Tatanka Iotake. Uh, I've got his picture a little bit bigger than the others because his presence is a little bit larger. Uh, Sitting Bull, you've all, uh, you're all familiar with already, although this is the first time he's entering into our narrative right here. He was uh, also the, uh, the, the leader of a uh, Hunkpapa group, a village, and um, he was a medicine man, a, a spiritual guide, as well as a leader. He had uh, been involved with his, with his followers in Red Cloud's War, but we didn't talk about him specifically there. 
uh, because he wasn't involved in, in a, a major way, the way that uh, Crazy Horse was. And there's Crazy Horse. He was leading a group of Oglala Lakotas that were allied with Sitting Bull and these others. The, uh, the picture there is not uh, a, uh, an accurate, uh, period, perfect photograph because as far as we know, there are no photographs of Crazy Horse. There are several photographs people claim to be of him, but no one can prove the veracity of any of them. Uh, they all have various problems of one kind or another. <clears throat> so I took instead uh, uh, a picture from, uh, of an actor playing Crazy Horse in a uh, documentary on AMC. Now, in addition, there were also some Minakanju Lakota and some Cheyenne that were a part of the overall group that uh, uh, was about to, that was in the area there where Stanley and Custer's soldiers were doing their surveying. On August the 4th, 1873, Custer with about a hundred men had scouted ahead of the main body of, uh, of the army group. There near the area in the map uh, with a circle that says Hansinger Bluff, although there was no such place at that time called Hansinger Bluff, it was, uh, um, it was called the uh, Yellowstone Hill. Uh, just, you know, it was, not, it was not a particularly noteworthy hill yet. It would be by the end of that day. Anyhow, um, they caught sight of a small number of warriors just a, a ways ahead of them. And so they gave chase. Whenever they would, uh, whenever the army detail would slow down, the Indians would slow down, and then they would speed back up when Custer sped back up, almost as if they didn't want to lose them, and they wanted them to uh, keep up the chase. Gee, that sounds like the sort of thing Crazy Horse had been known to do. Well, Custer kept chasing them, and they went past a uh, wooded area, and turned out that wooded area concealed about two or three hundred more warriors. And so there was a, uh, there was a fight uh, that, that started um, uh, immediately. Custer had his men circle up near a uh, dry creek bed and uh, try to hold off the, uh, the attacking Indians. And the fighting, the fighting kept up for over three hours. And uh, this was happening on a particularly hot August day uh, reportedly, the temperature was around 110 degrees, which makes for some pretty hot fighting. Just a little farther downriver from where all the fighting was going on, right there at that bluff, there were four members of Custer's party that had uh, gone out ahead of, uh, of the Custer party there to... Um, water their horses, and they were headed back toward the sound of the shooting to see what was going on, and they were ambushed at the hill by Rain in the Face and five of his warriors. The four individuals included uh, one uh, civilian merchant, a sutler, who traveled along with the soldiers and, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, was there to uh, to sell various goods to two privates and John Hansinger, originally from Germany, who was the chief veterinarian of the Seventh Cavalry. Uh, so they were rushing back to see what was going on. They got ambushed. Three of the four were killed, including Hansinger and the sutler and one of the uh, one of the two troopers. The fourth trooper managed to escape and uh, made his way uh, back to the uh, made his way east, where he caught up with the larger the larger body and uh, informed them that Custer was under attack. So 
the rest of the uh, group, several hundred more troopers, came uh, barreling in just as Custer and had just as Custer had ordered his men to mount up and charge, uh, countercharge against the attacking Indians. And the uh, the troopers and the Indians were both just fighting a lot more slowly after three hours in in the hot sun. And so everybody was pretty well prepared to, uh, to, to lay off the fighting for a while. So the, uh, the warriors retreated, having lost five of their number, and 11 troopers uh, had been killed. Well, 11 people. They weren't all troopers. One of them was a veterinarian, and, and the other was uh, essentially a salesman. So to this day... That bluff is known, it's remembered um, by the name of that veterinarian. A week later, at the mouth of the Bighorn River at a place called Peace Bottom, there was another skirmish. This time, Custer had eight companies of the 7th Cavalry with him, so about 450 men total. They had camped for the night, and somewhere between 800 to 1,000 Warriors descended upon them at dawn. Um, the fighting was not uh, anywhere near as, as as thick or sustained as that earlier skirmish. In fact, there was only uh, only one trooper was killed, and then uh, a first lieutenant was permanently disabled from a wound that he received. Um, after that, that was um, that was on uh, August the. 11th, they continued their survey, and by September, they were out of the area. Um, on the map there, there's a place called Prior Circle. That's not really related to, uh, to this stuff. That's the site of a very bloody battle between the Lakotas and their Cheyenne and Arapaho allies and the Crow Indians back in 1861. Well, what came of all this, uh, not anything immediately, because the, the railroad, uh, the building of the railroad was suspended for a while because of the Panic of 1873, when essentially the economy tanked. Uh, around the same time, the Credit Mobilier scandal uh, that involved several railroads uh, and, and corruption uh, led to uh, uh, a lot of a uh, lot of focus on on uh, railroad owners and a lot more a lot more lost government revenue. So um, the the building of the railroad didn't resume until several years later, after um, after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which is going to come um, about three years after this, but. That panic, that economic panic, is going to is going to set events in motion that are going to lead to that famous final confrontation between Custer and Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse three years later. How you ask? Well, the United States was on the gold standard uh, then and for a very long time thereafter. What that means is that every piece of paper money that was printed for every piece of paper money, every denomination, there had to be an equal amount of gold in the national treasury. All right. So in order to introduce more money into the economy, which is one of the things that governments want to do during a depression, well, they couldn't do that without... Uh, without more gold. And there had been there had been rumors that the Paha Sapa, the Black Hills that were sacred to the Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho uh, and other tribes, and which had been promised in that 1868 uh, Treaty of, uh, of uh, Fort Laramie, uh, it had been promised that uh, these would not be disturbed but there had been rumors there was gold in them, their hills. So President Grant authorized a scientific expedition, if you will, uh, a covert scientific expedition to, uh, 
to survey in the area of the Black Hills to see if there was gold, because, boy, was there a huge need for it at that particular moment in time. Who did he put in charge? Why, none other than Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer and the 7th Cavalry. Now, uh, according to all the treaties, the U.S. government did not have the authority to go poking around looking for gold uh, on Indian lands. According to the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty, though, they did have the authority to build forts if they were needed. So that was the cover for this expedition. Custer, theoretically, was out there scouting the area for potentially building a new fort. But uh, he and his surveyors, when they got there, discovered that, in fact, there was gold. Now, he was supposed to be discreet about, uh, about his findings and report them back to the president, at which point decisions could be made about what was going to be done. But Custer being Custer, instead he talked to the newspapers. And uh, next thing you know, the rush was on and miners came pouring into this area, the area of the sacred Black Hills, faster, uh, faster than you could shake them off, as it were. Uh, and this was, uh, this was a violation of the treaty on the part of the United States. At this point, just in this course, we have seen this story play out more than once already. We know what happens when gold gets discovered on Indian lands. And this is just talking about uh, on the Northern Plains. Okay, so if we were looking at a, a course about um, Native American history all over the continental United States, there'd be a whole lot more incidents of this. But you have an idea what's going to happen. For one thing, whole new towns sprang up practically overnight in the Indian, uh, in the Lakota Territory. Uh, towns like towns like Deadwood, wild, unruly towns, because this was not yet an organized federal territory. So there was not a lot of uh, um, there was not a lot of law enforcement other than whatever they could come up with locally. Uh, Deadwood is uh, perhaps most famous, aside from the uh, being the HBO TV series, which I highly recommend, but most famous for being, uh, being the place where famous gunfighter Wild Bill Hickok was murdered while playing cards, playing poker, in 1876. Now, um, I said there wasn't, uh, wasn't a whole lot of law enforcement. The best you could hope for, usually, was the U.S. Army. Um, because of course they had, uh, uh, they clearly had military jurisdiction because they had already been running around out there. The fact is, at first, President Grant authorized the use of the army to arrest trespassers onto the Indian lands, but uh, upon arresting them, all they could really do was escort them back out of the Indian lands and turn them loose, at which point they promptly turned right around and went back because why? Gold. That's why there was no way to keep those people out of there. It became evident by 1876, it became evident there was no way to keep this flood of miners out of that area unless you shot a few or hanged a few of them. And I, uh, I want you to be fully aware that in no way would I ever <clears throat> would I ever even begin to suspect that the United States government would actually authorize the killing of its own citizens in an election year, which is what 1876 was. Grant wasn't running for re-election. He had served his two terms, but uh, certainly was hoping that his party, the Republican Party, would be able to carry it. And it turned out it was a really, really close election between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden. So anyway, nope, can't go shooting citizens on an election year. Um, so what the heck are you going to do? There was really not much at this point that uh, Grant saw he could do 
uh, other than just kind of uh, throw up his hands and, and stand aside and watch it happen. And happen it did as more miners came pouring in in violation of the treaty. And uh, you know what kind of manners they had. <clears throat> you know what kind of attitudes they had. They weren't supposed to be there to begin with. And you know what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is that the, uh, the Lakotas and their allies are going to start killing them. And they did. And when that happened, then the United States Army did feel justified in stepping in in an election year. And so they did. 